Hi everyone, welcome back to Adrian's Commodore Basement. Okay, that was a joke. I know lately it seems like I've been doing a lot of Commodore videos. It just seems like that's what I've been focusing on lately when it comes to my projects. But believe me, uh, as you can see here, I have K-Pros and I have all sorts of other cool machines that I will get to on the channel. But right now, yeah, I'm, I'm in a rut of Commodore stuff. I, I'm just finding it so fun. So today's video, I'm going to be working on a Commodore 64. So we're jumping around a lot. So with this Commodore 64, I'm currently building this machine up. It's essentially an amalgamation of lots of different C64 parts, and it's going to turn into my sort of go-to brown bread bin machine. I have various machines that I use periodically, and I like this one. It has a really nice condition case, and the keyboard's in good shape. So I'm just doing the final touches to make this thing perfect for me. Let's dig into what that is. First though, I want to introduce you to my creamy, dreamy Commodore 64. Now, I had this on my Twitter and you may have seen it there, but it's essentially a Commodore 64 mounted in a VIC-20 case with a 64C keyboard. I love this particular combination, and if you can believe it, the 64 motherboard just screws right into this case as if it was designed for it which is actually just the fact that the Breadbin 64 is an evolution of the VIC-20 case and the standoffs are in exactly the same position. The only issue you have with these cases, with a VIC-20 case and a 64 motherboard, is the cartridge slot has a little bit of a lip, so you cannot plug a 64 cartridge in. But all the other openings are in the correct position where you can plug everything without issue. The final step of preparation of the beige 64 that I was just showing you is already done to this machine. So I want to demonstrate what I've done here and then I'll show you how to do it on the beige one. So when I turn this computer on you're going to know something interesting. The power LED won't come on immediately. The screen will flash which is normal but there'll be a slight delay. And there it is. But the computer still boots up normally. It just took maybe a little bit longer than normal. So like I mentioned before, when you're running the stock kernel ROM, which is what this is, disk I.O. is really slow. Now if we load a program off this SDIEC right here, and I'm going to load Portal, you'll see it's going to take quite a while. Alright, so it finished loading, and loading took this many seconds. Now if I run the program, works fine. There's the game portal. Excellent. Does a little bit of uh, additional decompression at this point, but it, it is completely loaded from the SDIEC. This is a modified Jiffy DOS kernel ROM. It says Jiffy DOS here, but it has the rainbow, which is a amalgamation of Jiffy DOS and Dolphin DOS, but essentially has the Jiffy DOS disk routines for fast loading off of disk drives with the right ROMs or the SDIEC. So if we load the same game, Portal, that took that long to load. That is the difference in speed. It's absolutely shocking how much faster it is. Look at that. So typically when you have Jiffy DOS, you have to remove the kernel ROM and you install a little circuit board that has a new EEPROM and then there's a little toggle switch where you drill a hole inside your case and that allows you to switch between the two ROMs. You turn the computer off, you flip the switch one way, you get standard stock ROM, you switch it the other way, you get Jiffy DOS. The reason for that is some games are actually incompatible with Jiffy DOS. You try to load them off the disk drive and it will just hang or crash. So you really do need to put that toggle switch in. Now my problem is, I don't like drilling holes in cases. And there's something else. Personally, I like to have reset functionality in my C64s as well, and that requires a separate hole where you have a little button you push, and then you have to build up a little circuit that does a hard reset. Ray Carlson has a good diagram of how you can do that. But again, that's two holes drilled, and I don't like doing that. So there are some Jiffy DOS ROMs with the adapters that you can find online that use the restore key to basically hold this down when you turn the computer on to select which ROM you're going to use. I think if you hold it, you get the stock ROM, and if you turn the computer on without holding it, you get the Jiffy DOS ROM. Now that's all well and good, I just don't have one of those adapters. 
But what I do have is a bunch of these. This is an Arduino microcontroller, just one I got off eBay. I think you can find these for a little bit under $2 now. And what I did is I wrote some code that runs on this that allows me to not only perform hardware resets on the Commodore 64, also to select between one of four different kernel ROM images and that is all done by using the restore key and it uses the power LED to tell you what it's doing. So let me demonstrate exactly how this works. Right now the computer is off and when I turn it on, you'll notice the power LED comes on and it blinks once. That's telling me that currently the computer is using ROM image one, which I have currently burned as the stock ROM. Here we are running the game Hero. And if I want to reset to get out of this, all I need to do is hold down the restore key until the light blinks, and then when I let go, the computer will do a hard reset. Now, to select between the different ROMs, you push restore and you hold it, and it will blink once. But instead of letting go, you wait till it blinks again, like two, and if I let go now, what it does is it resets the computer and switches the ROM. And like I said earlier, I have four different ROMs, and if you just keep holding down Restore, it will cycle through one through four, and then you let go to pick which ROM you want. So I'm going to move from ROM 2, which is this one, to ROM 4. So we got 2, 3, and 4. And I let go, and now I'm at Jaffe DOS, which is a modification of Jiffy DOS. When you switch between ROM images, it then stores the ROM you have selected into the EEPROM built into the microcontroller. So when you turn the computer off and you turn it back on, it will automatically resume back to the ROM you were using before. And if I want to go back to the stock ROM, I will go from four to, to one flash. There's one, I let go, and I'll be back at the stock ROM. So all of that is possible with this little Arduino board. We're going to need to do a few things and let's get right to it. Here's the bread bin I want to do the modification to. Let's open it up. So this particular board is a 25425. I like this particular layout of the C64. It's kind of one of the later bread bins. I have obviously outfitted this with lots of heat sinks because I like to do that to prolong the life of my computer. The VIC-2 gets really hot, so that gets a large heat sink I stole off a video card. The SID also gets pretty hot, so I put a chunky heat sink on that. And then the other ones, the PLA and the processor, these get little heat sinks as well. Of course, a prerequisite for doing this modification is you have to be able to remove the kernel ROM. The kernel ROM on all C64s is marked 901227. It's the center chip on these 324 pins. On your C64, this chip may not be in a socket. And if that's the case, you're going to have to remove it and install a socket. I'll put a link in the description for one of my other videos on my technique for removing a chip. Let's remove this chip from here. It's just sitting in the socket. All right, now right off the bat, I noticed that this socket is an original single wipe piece of crap socket. So hopefully this doesn't cause any issues. You will need to remove the board from the case and then desolder that metal shield that's behind the motherboard. That's because you will need to add a couple extra pins here and there to connect the wires to. Also, if you're gonna be installing a socket, you'll need that as well. So let's look at all the parts we're going to need to do this modification. Of course, we're going to start with the Arduino microcontroller. It's not really important which one you get, but I'll put a link to these ones, which are very inexpensive, and I like them because they're so small. So you start with that. We're going to need two sockets. We're going to need a 28-pin socket, and we're going to need a 24-pin socket. Please know that these need to be the rolled pin type. So you see how the holes are round on these, and the pins are round? It will not work with the other type of socket, the flat type. Because of the way we're going to be making the adapter with these two sockets, you'll see shortly that it has to be this type. You'll need a red LED to replace the factory LED. And the reason for that is the factory LED is a really old and super dim one. It will work, but it will be so dim you'll hardly be able to see it. So I recommend just getting a modern LED replacement. For the LED, we're going to use a 460 ohm resistor to bring it down from 5 volts. We're going to need some wires. These have DuPont connectors on each end, and I think these are about 12 inches or 30 centimeters long. These are also available from eBay, very inexpensive. And we're gonna need some pin headers. This is for soldering onto the Arduino. These are the angled type, so these don't stick straight up. I like these just because they're lower profile. We're gonna be connecting these wires with these DuPont connectors to the pins, 
And if you use the type that sticks straight up, the wire will stick up and it just take up a lot of space in the case. We're gonna need some zip ties just to kind of keep things neat. You will need an EEPROM. I use a 27C256. This is enough to hold the four kernel images. And then of course you need an EEPROM programmer to program the EEPROM. I'm using the TL866 Mini Pro. These are very inexpensive, available from eBay. I'll put a link to all this stuff in the description. Of course, you'll need to program the Arduino as well, so you'll need a computer to do that, plus something to plug into it. There's a million videos on YouTube of how to do that, and it depends on which Arduino you're using, so I'm not gonna get into the specifics of that. Well, let's start by building the adapter. So these are the two adapters, 24 pin and 28 pin. Essentially, the kernel ROM on the C64 is a 2364. Now, there are no EEPROMs, at least that I know of, that I can buy to program to just drop-in replacement. So if you notice I have these lined up, a lot of the pins are actually quite similar between these. Obviously there's four extra pins here at the top, but you notice A7 and A7 match up. In fact, all of the pins on this side, 1 through 12 and 3 through 14, completely match. So if I take this socket, which is the 28 pin, and I plug it into the 24, then it'll carry all of the signals that the chip that the EEPROM needs right up from the motherboard. It becomes more complicated on the other side though. And if you notice pin 18 is A11, but on the EEPROM, this is a chip enable pin. And A12 is also similarly funky, where A12 is moved up here, and on this one it's A11. It was that one that was moved up from the chip enable. Also the VCC pin, it's just 24, would be going right into A13, and we need that address line to be going to the Arduino. So the good thing about these types of sockets is we can cut these pins. So you see there's a little fat part there at the top. That's a perfect spot for us to solder a little wire to if we need to jump a pin, say, from this bottom connector up to somewhere else on the top. And then where we don't want the signal to go from the motherboard, which is this bottom one, up to the top, we could just cut these little legs. Now normally when you push these together, I only have them just lightly fit together, then the pins actually go quite deep into the socket. You would likely end up with contact between the cut leg, the bottom of this fat part, and the socket. So what you do is I push this in partially about that much, and then I solder these pins right into the socket and that keeps them from accidentally making contact and leaves enough room for the wires. This will make sense once we kind of wire this up. But the way we do this is we would just need to cut this pin 20 because we don't want CE talking to A11, and then we run a jumper wire from the bottom here on that pin, which would be A11, up to the correct pin on this socket. So it would go from here to about there. And we just do that for these few wires that need to change around, and then we have a working adapter. So you see the X's that I've marked here? These are all pins that I need to cut on this socket. And I'm just gonna cut these off. I'm gonna cut them off like that. So see how it's missing now? Just the fat part is there. So that was this pin. As you can see there, matches this. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna work on the power. So VCC is on pin 24 on the 24 pin socket, and it needs to go to these two pins on here. And what I like to use for this, and it's gonna be hard to see, are the little trimmings from when I cut resistors. And I basically am gonna stick this into pin 24, like that, and I'm gonna solder that in. And then I can just form that around and actually connect it. And then I just form the lead so it's touching that pin, and we're gonna solder that on. All right, and then I have another little lead just sort of resting on there. It's probably gonna fly off as soon as I try to solder this. So there we go. So right at this point, the VCC is all connected up. So at this point, we've done VCC. There's really just A11 and A12 that we need to worry about. I'm gonna use this super thin wire here to go between a11, which is this pin right there, and A11 on the bottom socket. So I like this wire. It's sort of bodge wire, but it's it's pretty, uh, it's flexible, but it's malleable. So if I wrap it around a pin, it shouldn't move. <laughs> shouldn't move as it flies right off. 
Sometimes it helps just to rest something on there while you're soldering, just to make sure it doesn't jump and move while you are doing the work. There we go. So that's A11 on that pin, and that's going to this pin right here, which is the other A11 on the top socket. So I'm just gonna bend this wire into place. Okay, there we are. Okay, so I just soldered a pin onto there. That's the A12 pin on the bottom socket. And that goes up here to this pin on the EEPROM. So that's over here on the other side. So I'm just gonna kind of bend this and form it into shape. Let's take a look at what I just did. That's a good solder joint. So let's just bend this wire here. I just had a thought. Before you attach these wires, probably a good idea to go through and solder all these pins on. It's because the wires get in the way and I need to solder around them. So luckily they're malleable, so I'm just, I'm gonna have to do that, but. So to do this, you need an angled tip on your soldering iron. You kinda gotta push this socket together so it's not, not all the way in, but just enough that it's touching. And then you go through and you solder Basically, I'll show you close up. It's gonna be hard to get this on camera. But you see I did that one pin there. So it's actually soldered into the socket. Even though it's not pushing all the way, it's now making good contact. And you gotta go through and do this on all the pins. So I just did another pin, but I'm really struggling to do it on camera. So I'm gonna to need to take it off. I'll do the rest of these off camera, but if you're having trouble soldering this, you just gotta do trial and error. Okay, we're not quite done. So right now I have all of the pins soldered on that side. And on this side, I have all the pins that are soldered that aren't cut. And the last thing we have to solder is I need to connect the ground to this floating pin right here. This is the CE or chip enable pin. So I've Cut a little length of wire and let's just connect this up. All right, so since I'm filming, I'm just really struggling getting the wire to stay. So I put a little piece of tape there to help. So I'm gonna loop that down so it's not in this opening and I'll show you why in a second. All right, so it's not the best, but it will do. Okay, so we're nearly done with the socket. I just need to connect wires that are gonna to go to the Arduino. So we're gonna use ground, VCC, A14, and A13. And I use this DuPont wire and I just cut the end off and we're gonna be running this through the socket and soldering directly to the pins. So this socket goes into the motherboard with a notch facing up. So I like to run these wires right through the middle of the two sockets like this. And then we're gonna loop around and we're gonna connect the wires directly to this. And then I can pull it tight and use a zip tie in the center to kind of hold these wires steady. Okay, I really struggled to do that on camera and I kind of made a mess of it, but those two wires are soldered on there. So now we're gonna move on to the power wires. And you can obviously solder them into a different spot. There's power right there and there's ground over here. So just, you know, hook it, hook it up to the two of the wires. Hook it up to the two pins that'll be the easiest for you. Okay, so I've soldered the black and the white wire. So, so the white wire, which is five volts, I'm getting off this pin right here. And remember that pin and that pin are common together. And then the black wire for ground, I'm getting from there. And then I have the wires just sort of come out at the bottom and I'm gonna put a zip tie right in the middle here to hold them down. All right, so there's the zip tie, that's how I do it. I sort of tuck it in under there. It doesn't interfere with the chip or the socket when it's in the middle like that, so I would recommend you do it that way as well. I recommend you check your work with a multimeter at this point.
So that's how you make the adapter socket. I've made a few of these already. It's a little bit fiddly and I gotta say it's really hard to do with the camera. I'm much faster when I do it without the camera in the way. But you do these and you'll get it down. To do one of these yourself, it's really not that difficult. You just have to kind of think logically by looking at these two pictures to see which pins you gotta connect up together. Let's turn our attention to the Arduino. So essentially this printout here shows which IO pins I'm gonna be using. And that's basically three through eight. So you need six pins for that. And then to program it, you gotta to connect to here. And then we're also gonna power from those pins. And that's another six. So you just cut these little angled pieces and connect them up to the board, line them up in the correct spot. And then I'm gonna, we're soldering those on. And my trick is you solder one pin only. You melt it again and then you can reposition the pins because right now like this right now these top ones are soldered on quite crooked so you put your fingernail on the black plastic part and you melt the one blob like that and now when we look see nice and flat and correct angle as well now I can do the rest of the pins All right, while we're at it, we're gonna work on the LED. I'm gonna use these DuPont connectors as well, so I'll just cut them off, just like I did the other ones. On LEDs, the shorter leg is the negative, or goes to ground. So I will be connecting the LED to one of those, and I'm gonna use the brown wire here for ground, just, just so I can remember a little more easily later. Okay, so the LED is connected. I'll just trim the lead to be exactly the same length as the other one. And I put the LED on the positive lead. It's always a good idea to put heat shrink on there to cover up these leads. So we're gonna use this much heat shrink. Okay, one power LED ready for the case. All right, so let's back to go back to the 64. So the power LED you're not gonna need. Now you will need a little bits of plastic that are on here. I'll show you that in a second. You gotta take them off the original one. You can leave this plugged into the case if you so desire, but I take it off. Now taking a look at this code snippet again, we have three things we gotta connect to the C64 motherboard. We have to connect the pin eight on the Arduino to the restore key line. We have to connect pin three to the XROM line and pin seven to the reset line. Now where you find those is probably gonna vary slightly from 164 to another. So you may have to look online, maybe Ray Carlson's website. If you look at his information on how to set up the hard reset circuit, it'll tell you where to connect it to each board type. But on this particular artwork here, the 25425, the XROM line is right here. It comes off the PLA chip and I've actually put a little pin header on there already. Up here by the user port, that's the reset line, it's the third pin over. And I've looked on a couple different types of C64 and there's always a hole there. So you can just stick a, a pin header through there and that's what will be connecting the reset line. So this is the keyboard connector and this pin right here, it's the third up. So there's a pin, a blank, and it's the next pin. That's the restore key. Now it has a dedicated line because of the way it connects directly to the non-maskable interrupt line on the processor. So it's easy to find where it goes on the board. It's not like these other ones, which are matrix. So just tone that out. So on this board, the reset line, which comes from that pin, can be found on this edge of R41 and also on the left side here of C38. Now on some of my boards, C38 goes between this pin and there's a pin under the middle and that leaves this one open. So in that case, I can just put a pin header right there. Okay, so at this point, all we have left to do is program the EEPROM and program the Arduino. The way I program Arduino is I use a little FTDI board from China. It's pretty simple with these. You just connect these pins straight through. And I will connect up the power. Make sure you have this set for five volts. Now this has never been used, so they always load this with like a little blink program, which is why it's blinking. All right, so load up my code into your Arduino IDE. Make sure you have the serial port set right in the type of Arduino. And we're gonna simply just click upload. See it uploading here. And it says done. 
Let's program the EEPROM now. Okay, so I have the Mini Pro plugged into the computer and the EEPROM is ready. On the machine here, I have my C64 4 kernel file right here. I have this set up for the right EEPROM here. It's a Hitachi 27C256G. Let's open the kernel file. Load this into memory. There it is. Let's put the chip into the programmer. We'll do a quick blank check because I'm not sure if this is definitely blank. And it is. And program. All right, all that's left is to put all the parts together. So let's take the EEPROM and install it into the socket. All right, so the EEPROM is in there. Let's try to clean that thermal compound <laughs> out of those sockets. Spray this with a little IPA. There's still a little bit of crap in there. Should be fine, it's non-conductive. All right, so this just pushes down and into the socket. Next up, we're gonna start connecting our Arduino to things. I made the white and the black wires, the ground and VCC. Our power LED connects. You connect one wire to ground, so that's the brown wire in my case. And then if we check the little list here, power LED is pin four to pin four. Then we take the two address lines, and I don't remember which is which. There's A13 and A14. It doesn't really matter if you have them backwards, it's just the ROMs will be out of order when you switch. Those go to pins five and six, like that. And now we have three more pins to connect. And I have four wires, so we'll just peel one of them away. So according to my sheet, pin seven is the reset line. So that goes up to here. Pin three is XROM, and that connects to this pin header right there. And the last one is the restore key, which is very essential for the operation of this thing. And if you remember on my computer, I have this little um, female there. So female to female isn't gonna work, so I'm gonna need to find a little pin to stick between these. All right, everything's connected and it looks horrible, but we'll be able to clean this up in a second. I just wanna test this out. Okay, everything is connected. I have the keyboard here so we can test the restore. Monitor's on, Arduino's ready to go. Turn the power on, we got NTSC. So the power LED is working, but we're not getting anything on the screen. Let me hit the restore key and see if it flashes the LED. It does. So the, the Arduino is working, restore key is working, but we're not getting anything on the monitor. Okay, so I'm pretty sure the problem I'm having right now is the socket. If you recall, I pointed out that the socket that was on this machine is a really crappy one that Commodore used. And I've had problems in the past where those would not accept the round pins that I used on this adapter. I can test that out with the multimeter and then if I find that that's the problem, I'm going to need to replace that socket. So with the three ROM chips, pretty much all of the signals that go to each pin are the same between each socket. Except for the chip enable pin, which is pin 20, I should be able to tone out continuity. Like for instance, this pin right here is data line three and data line three will be available on all of these. So if I touch here and here, so we're getting continuity. And let me check here, I'm getting continuity. So I'm just gonna go through, so data line four has no continuity. So I bet you if I push down hard on the socket, yep, see it started working. And that's part of the problem is watch this. Uh, this, this is pushed in really hard on the board, but I can just lift it right out like that. It's that easy to take out of the board. The problem is these sockets. They're just not good at accepting anything but the flat IC pins. So it's time to change that socket out. So that came out really easily. My strategy with when I remove sockets is to desolder as much of the solder on the bottom as I can first. Then I cut the socket in half with some snips and that essentially allows me to work on getting each half out without needing to fiddle around with the entire socket all at once. Luckily it came right out. This time I didn't have to do any hot air. That's a first actually for me. Normally getting sockets out is a huge pain. I'll of course be installing a new rolled round pin socket because these are just so much more durable and better actually than the regular ones. And that goes right in. So this will make good contact with my adapter. 
So the new socket was a great fit. When I pushed my adapter into it, it had a really firm and a deep connection. It went all the way in. So there should be no more problems with bad contacts. Okay, let's power this up. Oh yes, there we go. So if I hold the restore key down, so see the power LEDs over here, hold down restore. One flash, two flashes, I let go. There we are. So let's just do the final cleanup. I like to mount the Arduino right on the RF modulator. So I put a little bit of this double-sided 3M tape right there. And basically stick that right there. You know, I hang it off the edge so that the pins aren't gonna contact the RF modulator, but that just sort of keeps it out of the way. So here's a close-up of the stack uh, in the kernel socket. And yeah, it's a little high, but because the bread bin has a lot of room inside, there's no problem with using this. And people will complain I don't cover the UV windows, but there's really no reason to. Uh, you need a very specific wavelength of light to erase an EEPROM. Even sunlight doesn't do it. So there's no worry of this getting erased over time. And I mean, even if it did, I could just write a new one. So there, there's no real issue there. It does always worry me that, see, these types of connections aren't very firm. So I usually take a little bit of tape and just tape around that just to make sure it stays connected. And then let's just tidy these wires up a little bit. Once they've been in sh the shape that they're in for a little while, they, they basically stay. But we'll just use an, we'll use this zip tie. What I like about having the Arduino right here is it's very easy to reprogram it. You just pull these wires off and then you can plug your programming tool right into these pins. And you can add or change the code anytime you feel like it. The final step is replacing the power LED with the new one. Now, I had this out earlier, but I put it back in just so I can show you how to take it out. You might wonder how to do it, but it's actually not that hard. So let me show you what to do. When you look at the back side, there's going to be a little retaining ring that you have to lift up. Now, I don't have this on fully, but there's the ring. It's this little plastic piece here. You might have to pick at it or use a small screwdriver, but it's pushed over the plastic that's right there. So you just pull it up, and once you lift it up, then you can actually push the LED. So I'm pushing it from this side through and into the case. See, like that? So now the LED is out, and that little retaining ring is still on the LED. This little plastic trim piece then pushes up out the front of the computer. There it is. But what you need to do is take the LED, the original one, and slide that retaining ring off. So there's the LED. So there are the two parts we need. And then we take this little black piece and we have to push it through the front of the case again. That's the trim piece. And then we're gonna push the new LED through this hole like that and it clicks into place. So now we're gonna slide that little retaining ring back over this. Now it helps to hold the little trim piece on the other side and we need to slide this over. It essentially prevents the LED from being pushed inside the case. So while that ring is on there, it holds the LED firm. Let me flip it over and show you how it looks. So the new LED, it's firmly there, and if I push on it, it doesn't go back into the case because that retaining ring kind of holds it all in there. And when I turn the power switch on, we have a nice bright red LED now. It's actually much brighter than the original and not, not an obtrusive and horrible bright, so I like it. All right, so that's it. This video was really long. I hope you found something useful in it. And I'm very curious if you do end up building one of these boards for yourself using the Arduino and my code, I would love to hear your feedback. I'm very open to feedback when it comes to the code on the Arduino and both the way I made the adapter. If you have some tips and tricks on how to do it more easily or better, I would love to hear from you. You can look on the about page for my channel to find my email address if you wanna to talk to me outside of the comment system. Otherwise, Put your comments and questions in the comment section below. I hope you found this video interesting and somewhat useful. And if you liked it, give me a thumbs up. And if you didn't, you know what to do, thumbs down. Of course, you can subscribe for more videos. And we'll see you next time. Thank you very much. Bye. Okay, let's see where we are right now. So on this side, all of the pins are soldered in. Oh. Hey Google, pause. Mom.